Okay, let's get started. Welcome back. Week four of CS125. What we're doing this week, we're going to wrap up our discussion of imperative programming. By Friday, we're going to be talking about objects, which is a new idea that allows us to model data. It's one of the core features of the Java programming language, and it's something that we're sort of will sort of usher us into the second half of, or the, the second third of the class. Uh, where we'll talk about that for, for the couple weeks following. Next week, um, so just to give you a sense of where we are in the semester and orient you a little bit, uh, MP0 is due today at 5 p.m. We have office hours all day today. Please do MP0. You cannot succeed in this class if you don't do the MPs. If you think that you've done MP0, check your grades page to make sure that we think that you've done MP0 because... You know, people have made a variety of different types of mistakes. I understand that. That's why we do this. Um, this happens during the first time. Uh, but we really want to make sure that they're all on the same page here, right? So, like I said, if, if you haven't done MP0, um, then I assume that your plan is to not continue taking the class because you need to do the MPs in this class in order to succeed. They're 40% of your grade, and they're 40% of your grade that pretty much everybody gets. If you look at, you know, if you can already see this happening in MP0, you look at the median score in MP0, it's headed towards 100 or, or 90. Yeah, question. Can you repeat the question? Okay, I guess I don't need to answer. Um, yeah, so, so please come in today and, and finish this up. Next, so the next MP will be out today. It's a two-weeker. Um, it will be out today at 5. It will be doing two weeks from today. And this MP is not only something that's going to use some of the concepts we're going to talk about today, but it's also great preparation for our midterm. So we have a midterm next week on imperative programming. That's just scheduled the same way you would schedule a quiz. It's done in the same environment. Uh, the format's a little bit different. We will review for the midterm next Monday in class. So we have that set aside to do midterm review. That'll give us a chance to talk about some of the things you guys need to know, you know, review anything that you, you might have missed, answer questions about that. So this week, today, Wednesday, we're sort of wrapping up our imperative programming ideas. On Friday, we'll start talking about objects. And then on Monday, we'll go back and, and do some midterm review. We will start homework on objects on Friday and continue that next week so that we can start preparing you for what we're going to do next. But we do have that um, midterm on the calendar. So as I said, working on MP1, getting that started this week will be great preparation for the first midterm because MP1 is a midterm that is an assignment that heavily stresses your ability to write imperative programs and work with the type of ideas that we've been talking about so far. And again, we, we will start and continue homework during midterm week. Um, these will be not particularly hard problems, but useful for getting you started on objects. One thing I want to I want to warn you about and point out. So there are some people that come into this class without um, programming background, and we love those people, and they succeed in this class. There are also some of you that came in with a little bit of background, and here's what happens: you come in with a little bit of background, and you're comfortable for a couple of weeks, and so you get into these habits of you know not starting the homework until very late at night, or waiting until the last minute to start the MP. You're not preparing for the quiz. And then at some point, we catch up to where you are. We catch up to your prior background, and we go you know, barreling right by it. And sometimes you know, it's the students that come in with a little bit of background that aren't prepared for the pace of the class. Because you start out for the first couple of weeks, and it feels easy. And then at some point, you, know, you hit this big you know, inflection point in the difficulty curve. And you know, you're not prepared for it. You don't have the schedule set up. Sometimes the people that come in with no background do better, because from week one, they're working. They're doing the work. They're getting the practice. They're preparing for the quizzes properly. They get into the good habits early on. And so when, you know, those of you that came in with a little background, if you, if you came in with a little background, like, trust me, at some point, we're going we're gonna to blow right by that. If we don't, then why did you take the class? Um, you know, my goal, goal is to teach all of you something new, regardless of whether you never wrote a line of code before or you have a little bit of background from a previous course or some prior experience. But again, if you came in with a little background, just be wary of this, because this will happen. Sometimes this is the week it happens. Sometimes it's when you get to objects. Sometimes maybe it's a little bit later. Um, but just be ready for that, because that's, a, that's a, an experience that is a little different than the people that came in with no background. They're used to it. 
they've, they've gotten into good habits about how to do the work and how to prepare for the assessments and how to start early on things. And if you've been, you know, if you've gotten into bad habits with that, that will catch up to you eventually. Just be ready for that. Okay. So today, we're going to do a mixture of things. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new idea. Um, and we'll see a few examples of that. And that's going to be uh, covered uh, briefly on this week's quiz. And then we're going to go back and we're going to do some practice with strings and algorithmic problems. So any questions at this point before we go on so that I can answer either about the schedule or the material? Um, you know, the quizzes are getting harder. That's one of the things that, that happens in each unit of the class. So first couple quizzes, you know, we see pretty good scores. The last quiz, the average dropped a little bit. You guys actually still did better than last fall, which I was, I was impressed by. Um, so give yourself a pat on the back for that. This week's quiz is harder. The midterm is harder still. So if you're starting to see your scores go down a little bit, that's probably OK. Um, but you know, the, the difficulty, we ramp up the difficulty on the quizzes a little bit every week. As always, the best way to prepare for this week's quiz, next week's midterm, do the practice problems. The problems on the quiz are very, very similar to practice problems that we've given you. OK. So today, we're going to talk about arrays again. So we, we got into strings, and now we're going back, and we're going to talk about arrays because we're going to introduce you to a new feature of arrays. And this is actually going to really broaden the kinds of data that we can work with. So one of the things that's happening in this class that's super exciting, I hope, to you, because being a computer scientist is about working with data. So we started out, and all we could do were single values. And that wasn't very interesting, sort of interesting. We tried to make it as interesting as possible, like on MP1. But then we started talking about arrays, single dimensional arrays. And then we could, there were certain types of data we could work with, time series data, you know, DNA, uh, strings, sequences of, of single sequences of characters. But now, with multidimensional data, there's a whole new world that opens up to us. So DAV arrays can have multiple dimensions. On line two, it, this should look familiar to you. This is our initialization of a single dimensional array that has size four. This will store four integers. How do you know it's single dimensional? It has one pair of square brackets in the array initialization on the left, the array declaration. So I'm telling Java, I'm creating a single dimensional array called samples that's going to store integers. And then on the right, I'm initializing it to store, to have space to store four integers. Now, on line six, we're going to see some new syntax. So this is a two dimensional array. How do I know it's two-dimensional? Because there's two pairs of square brackets on the left in the array declaration. And on the right, there's also two pairs of brackets. So now I'm saying, Java, I'm going to declare an, a variable called board that's going to store characters. But not just going to store a single dimension of characters. It's going to store two dimensions. And this array has size four in the first dimension and size second eight in the second dimension. We can go farther. We can just extend this on up as long as we want. So on line 11, I'm declaring a three-dimensional array of doubles. Three pairs of square brackets on the left. And on the right, when I declare this array, and if I want to fully initialize it, I need to tell Java how much space to allocate for it. And so I say this three-dimensional array of doubles has size six in the first dimension, size eight in the second dimension, and size 10 in the third dimension. So this will allow me to store, again, you know, a, a three-dimensional array uh, with, with one size six, the second size eight, and the third size 10. So the, the way that arrays work internally in Java is you know, uh, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we understand the difference between the, the single and the multidimensional arrays. I'll show you a little bit about the internals of this. Um, but so on the top, I have a, a two-dimensional array. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, OK. I remember what I wanted to say about this slide. Sorry. Um, so what am I doing at the top? I'm initializing an array called samples, the two-dimensional array of integers. It has size four in the first dimension and size eight in the second dimension. Now, down here, I'm doing something interesting. I'm initializing a one-dimensional array 
of called sample slice. And on the right side, I'm initializing it to the first element of the first dimension of samples. So essentially, when I declare a multi-dimensional when I declare a multi-dimensional array in Java, what I'm really doing is I'm creating an array of arrays. So I'm creating an array. So samples is an array that stores um, four arrays of integers. Each one of those second arrays is of size eight. So if I um, if I do this on line five, so I'm getting the first element of samples. That first element, if I leave off the, uh, the second index, what I'm getting is an array of integers. What would the size of samples slice be if I printed it off? Any guesses? Yeah. Eight, right. So the valid indexes for the first level of samples are zero, one, two, and three. It has four, stores four arrays. Each of those additional arrays stores eight integer values. So if I pull the first one out, then sample slice has size eight. So this is how arrays work. Java stores multidimensional arrays as arrays of arrays. Or if you have a three-dimensional array, as arrays of arrays of arrays. We're actually not gonna force you to work with three-dimensional arrays in this class, but you will get practice with, with uh, multidimensional arrays. So let's make sure that we, let's print the length of sample slice, it's eight. That's good. Let's try pulling like a invalid index. So now you're gonna see I have an array index out of bounds exception because sample stores four arrays, each of which store is of size eight. That's how I've initialized it. So if I try to ask it for the fifth array in the first dimension, it doesn't exist. Other than this, I have, you know, pretty much, um, yeah, so we, so there's also a, um, I, I hate talking about this. I, I wish I got rid of the slide, but, um, but it's, it's useful for talking about MP1. So you can initialize multidimensional arrays. Remember we had that static array initializer syntax using the curly brackets that we used for single dimensional arrays. You can also do this for multidimensional arrays. Now this gets awful, okay? It's very, very hard to read. So I would suggest that you not do this. Um, like this slide says, this could be quite confusing because one of the problems that many of you have in your brain, one of the things, so a, one of the things I like about teaching a class like this is in general, a lot of you come in here with not a lot of huge pre-existing knowledge that I have to fight back against. But there is one thing, is that you guys think arrays have rows and columns and you're wrong. They don't, we don't use that terminology here. Um, and I'll show you why in a couple slides. So here you might think, you know, oh, well, this is zero, zero, this is zero, one, this is one, one or something. Like you have some sense because you've seen spreadsheets or something about how this is supposed to work. Um, this, this turns out to violate your intuition, right? So the way that these look when they're uh, in your code doesn't actually map to what you would expect. Um, okay, so that's these. Um, yeah, okay angry with me because I don't have a semicolon here. Let's fix that. Oh, I need some commas here too. There we go. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm not going to, we're not going to fight with this too long, but this is on here. So again, this is probably, uh, particularly when you guys start working on MP1, this is one of the things that is going to frustrate you the most. And it is just the biggest misconception that people have about arrays. Period. And if somebody taught you this before, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Go talk to them about it. Um, Java arrays do not have rows and columns. We will talk about the first dimension of an array and the second dimension of an array, or the third dimension of an array. We can talk about what that stores. But there is no, rows and columns are a convention that not every array in Java has to follow, and not every array in Java should follow. So one of the things I always ask people when they start using this terminology around me is, what do you do if you have a four-dimensional array? Then what do you call things? Or even a three-dimensional array. Okay, rows and columns are, are a terrible crutch. And I would encourage, like, if you can sort of do like, um, you know, the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind type thing and just sort of zap that part of your brain and eliminate that knowledge, um, that would be great. That will help you out a lot. But we will definitely push back on this. And I will try to avoid using that terminology as much as possible. 
Again, these aren't spreadsheets. Um, how you set up your arrays is totally up to you. The first, second, third index of a multidimensional array in Java, what those mean is up to you as the program. You can set up your array to model your data however you want. So for example, on MP1, we set up the arrays that store the photo data that you're gonna be working with to store X in the first dimension and Y in the second dimension. That's up to us. There's no rule about that. It's just a decision that we made when we wrote the MP. You could do the opposite. You could store Y in the first dimension and X in the second dimension, where these are the coordinates of that particular uh, piece of data in the image. Totally up to you. And of course, this is particularly important once we start talking about higher levels of, of dimensionality. And, and we're not gonna do much with uh, three or four dimensional arrays in this class, but there's plenty of places in the world where you need to model or represent high dimensionality data. So the world fundamentally, even if you don't worry about the four or five or six dimensions that the string theorists claim are uh, you know, hiding somewhere, all shriveled up, curled up in the corner, or like vibrating a little bit or whatever. Um, even if you don't worry about that, life is inherently four dimensional, right? We have three spatial dimensions and time. So you can't even represent what's going on in this room without using a four dimensional array. So just give up on the, the rows and columns. So multidimensional arrays are, are super exciting because they allow us for the first time to represent some of the data that you guys are really excited about, some of the data that, that shapes your life, some of the data that um, you guys use all the time. So what are the kind of things that I could represent in a multidimensional array? Yeah. Music? Yeah, we'll get there. Um, that's a surprising one to most people, but music is multidimensional, turns out. Not a high dimensionality, but it is. What else? Photos, yeah. Pictures. I mean, this is, I don't know, what percentage of the amount of stuff that gets sent around the internet is either photos or, so, so how many dimensions do I need to, st how many dimensions do I need to be able to store in order to represent a photo? What do you guys think? Two, the, a photo consists of a grid of data where every piece of data represents the color of one tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of the picture. And so in order to represent a photo, I need to be able to uh, determine where a particular piece of that data is in the image. So I have uh, you know, an X position and a Y position. What's a small modification to photos that you guys are probably also very interested in? Something else, you know, again, corresponds to a good portion of the data flowing across the internet, particularly at night. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with this. Yeah. Videos. Right. So if I take a series of photos and put them one after another, moving pictures, I get a video. So now I have a three-dimensional array. Every, um, you know, where one axis is time and the other two dimensions uh, represent uh, a photo, right? And I have a series of photos, you know, uh, ordered in time. So that's what a video is, right? So three-dimensionality, I can do a video. There's all sorts of scientific data that you might want to be able to represent. So I, I don't know what this is, but um, it's a graph of some kind. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using, this graph is actually trying to visualize four dimensional data, which is hard because our world is, you know, the world that we can perceive is three dimensions, right? So here I've got three dimensions that are being shown in perspective. And then I have a fourth dimension, which the person who created this graph has added through color, right? So this is, uh, you know, one idea about how to represent four-dimensional data. Sound, somebody pointed this out. So a lot of people are, are confused by this. Like sound is, I, I, I told you sound was a series of uh, pressure measurements, right? Doesn't sound like it's multidimensional. Where do, where do the other dimensions come from in music? They haven't always been with us. There was a period of time where sound only had a single dimension. You could represent it in a single array. But now it's got more, why? Yeah. You have many tracks, but, but the reason why sound usually has more than one track has something to do with you. What do you have? Yeah. yeah. Nope. Talking about you, your body. How many ears do you have? Most of you. Maybe somebody had an accident, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, most of us have two ears, right? We hear things in stereo. When you listen to music, there's actually two independent signals that are being fed 
one into one ear, one into the other, at least. If you go see like a movie, there's actually maybe eight or 10 different tracks that are being fed to that speaker and that speaker and the two speakers here and the one right under the stage and the two up top or whatever, and the subwoofer has its own signal or whatever. But at minimum, the, the kind of music, even you know, if you're not in a fancy amphitheater that we've been listening to for decades, is stereo. That's what it refers to, two ears. And there's actually a lot of uh, audio engineering that goes into using that to create a sense of space when you listen to music. And so you, when you listen to a song, you might get the sense that like the drummer is kind of over there. The reason you get that sense is because the signals are arriving at your ears slight, at a slightly different time, and your brain is perceiving that that drum kit that's part of the song is off in that direction. And you know, audio, as you create, as people create music, they manipulate that to give you a sense of space. This is one of the things that causes bands, causes music to sound different, right? Some bands have a particular sound that has to do with how their music is mixed, not just with the content of the music itself. All right, so we've gone through some of this. Pictures and images, obviously, two or three dimensional, you know, um, data about the world we live in, you know, just the position of everything, including time we get to 40, sound, even, even stuff that turns, that sounds simple, temperature, right? So we think of a place having a single temperature, but of course, Champagne doesn't have one temperature. Champagne has, you know, millions of temperatures at every po possible point in space. We don't measure all of them because we usually say that one temperature measurement is a good approximation of how it feels. Temperature doesn't change all that rapidly. Um, but there are, you know, there, there is something called microclimate, right? There can be parts of a city or parts of a place that are a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler than other parts because of the dynamics of how air moves around that particular place. All right, so when we're working with two-dimensional uh, data, we frequently see this type of construct. So this is, a, um, this is a loop. You see something that looks familiar on line one. This is the typical loop that we use to iterate over a single-dimensional array. But just like with single-dimensional arrays, a lot of times I want to visit every element inside my two-dimensional array in order to um, on MP1, you guys will be making modifications, making it a little bit redder, a little bit bluer, or flipping it around, or rotating it a little bit, or whatever. Um, so to visit every element of a two-dimensional array, I use this new construct, which is a two-level uh, two for loop. So my outer for loop is looping over the first dimension of the array. And then my inner for loop is looping over the second dimension of the array. A lot of times, we talked before about how i is a common index variable for a, a for loop. For an inner for loop, j is a, a common index variable. So you'll see this a lot. Normally, these would not be considered good variable names, but when you're looping through arrays, ij is, is pretty, pretty normal for a two-dimensional array. Again, if you get to three, you can use k. If you get to four, something has gone wrong, and, and you can, but you can use l. l is a little hard because it looks a lot like i. So here what I'm doing is I'm going through the array and I'm printing every value inside of it. All right, so let's have some, uh, let's have some fun with arrays. Um, and let's do a little problem here. Again, you guys are gonna get lots of practice with multi-dimensional arrays on upcoming homework problems on MP1. Um, but let's, let's go through and let's, let's do a little problem with this. So here what I'm doing, how many people are familiar with the game Tic-Tac-Toe? Okay, if you're not familiar with the game Tic-Tac-Toe, ask a neighbor how it works. The goal is to place, you know, it's played on a three by three board. Uh, players are allowed to put one, uh, you know, mark down, either an X or an O in each turn, and your goal is to get three in a row. Tic-Tac-Toe is also a game that is referred to as solve, meaning that there is an obvious strategy for playing Tic-Tac-Toe that can at minimum uh, cause you to never lose. You won't win all the time, uh, but you can always uh, force a draw. Uh, there's a very simple computer algorithm for doing this, regardless of how, um, how your opponent plays. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm initializing a board. My board is a two-dimensional array of characters, and I'm using this static uh, Java initialization that allows me to, to set the board dimensions and give it values all at once. Now, here's how I'm representing my board. And you guys will have to work, think about this when you do MP1. 
so um, X is the X symbol that's being used by one player. So that indicates that a player is played in that position. And O is the symbol used by the other player. So that indicates that the other player is played in that position. And what's a dot? What do you guys think a dot is? In my little, um, so I just made this up. There's no rule about how to do this. But I'm using a dot to indicate what? Yeah. That's an empty space, so no one has played in that. So at this point, it looks like um, there have been six moves, um, and the board has nine spots, so there are three empty spots on the board. So the first thing is, let's just um, get some practice with um, let's get some practice with this. So for now, I'm just going to modify this so it returns. Um, oh, right. <laughs> Yes, remember characters in Java, single quotes. Okay, but well, let's um, just do a little bit of poking around in my board. So, in Java, when I have a multidimensional array, the syntax for getting or setting one of the values is an extension of the syntax we've already seen. So, I use two indices. The first index is into the first dimension, the second index is into the second dimension of the board. So this is printing off the character at position 0, 0. Now, how that position would look on the screen, you assume this would be part of a game where people could look at it, would really be up to you. Um, you could put 0, 0 in the top left corner. You could put it in the bottom right corner. Um, it doesn't matter. So that's what's at position 0, 0. What's at position 0, 1? That's an O. What's at position 0, 2? That's a dot. So essentially, I'm going through this level of, of the array. What do you guys think? Is it position 2-2? Two, two? Anyone want to guess? Got multiple opinions. I like that. X, 2, second level in the first array. Second, uh, sort of, the, 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 third, uh, the third array in the first dimension and the third value in that array. Okay. Questions about this before we go on. So let's do the following. But before we try to figure this out, let's just write a for loop to iterate over this array. Okay, so here is my typical single dimensional for loop. Let's just print the index. Ah, sorry, turn forward. Oh, it's called board in my function. All right. So now I'm iterating over all of the indices of current board, or the board that's being passed to this function. Inside my function, I'm calling it board. So I go up through board.length. That's the length in the first dimension of my board. That's three, and so I see um, that I've printed indexes zero through three. So let's do the second level here. Now, now here's where things get a little bit interesting, because the question is, what's the length that I should use in my second level for loop? So I don't want to use board.length, because that won't work if my board has uneven dimensions. Board.length is three, but if this was an um, array that had dimension three, size three in the first dimension and size six in the second dimension, then this wouldn't work. So what I'm going to do here, what I'm going to train you guys to do, is use the length of the current subarray. So the current subarray is board index i dot length. Remember, Java stores multidimensional arrays internally as an array of arrays. So if I peel off board i, what I'm getting is another array. That array also has a length. So this will work. And now let's print, also print J. And I'm going to put a space in front of it just so that we, we can see it. OK. I can see how I'm going here. So I start at the first level of the first array. And I go through each value in that subarray. I get 0, 1, 2, and I continue until I get through all of the subarray. 
So now that we've done this, let's print out the values in my board. So i is my index into the first dimension of board, j is, in my, in my, is my index into the second dimension of board. And actually, let's do this. Let's make this a little bit more clever. Cool. So I, I format, I've tried to format this nicely so that we can look at it together. Um, what am I doing? I'm using print to print the characters in the same line, and then every time I get to a new index in the first dimension of the board, I print a new line. So that prints this in a way that looks like you might see it in a game. Okay, so, um, has in, is there a player that's won this game? Based on the rules of tic-tac-toe that you guys know. What player is that? Okay, so that's actually the hardest dimension to check in the tic-tac-toe game. So, let me ask a different question. Is there a player that's won in either, um, you know, going across or down? No, right? Here I've got, you know, three different symbols, three different symbols. Essentially, the closest anybody got is O, and O is almost one in this dimension, but not quite. In the other dimensions, I don't have a win. So, how are we going to do this? And for now, let's only check... It's going to be a homework problem for you guys to work on later this week, but let's only check for one dimension. Let's only check, like, in the... Um, Let's only check uh, either vertically or horizontally. Not sure exactly which one it's going to be. But what do I need to do here? What's my algorithm? So you guys are looking at this data. How, do you, how would you tell? How would you explain to a computer how to decide if somebody has won this game? What's one of the things I need to do? Yeah. No, 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 no. Don't, don't explain it to me using Java. Just tell me how to do it. Nope, nope, you're using Java terms, right? How, like, if you're looking at this game, let, let's say you were trying to explain, you know, to, a, to a, a, a niece or a nephew how to determine whether or not somebody won tic-tac-toe. Yeah. Three in a row. So I start, so for example, let's say I'm checking um, horizontal. I start here and I say, okay, there's an X here. And then I look at the next value, and I say, is it equal to the first value in, um, is it equal to the first value? No. And so I can stop. What I'm, the case I'm looking for is when all three of those values are the same. So again, now I go down to the next, um, the next horizontal slice, and I say, O, is X equal to O? No. Okay, so I can stop. Right? And then I go down to the last horizontal slice, and I start with O, in order for there to be a winner, all three symbols have to be O. What's the other thing I have to be careful about here? Let me, uh, let me put something in here that might confuse us. Does this game have a winner? No. But it has, but you know, but you're explaining this to someone and say, it has three symbols in a row. So Dot has won the game. So I'm looking for three symbols in a row as long as they're not Dot. Okay, so think about how to do this. So, so here's what I'm going to try. I'm going to grab the first symbol. In here, and then I'm just going to print it off in this loop. Just want to make sure this works. This guy. Oh, well, you know what? Let's do this. Too. Okay. So now I'm grabbing the first symbol in each. These could be horizontal or vertical slices. It depends on how you lay out the board. It doesn't matter. So going through the, the first dimension of the board, and I'm grabbing the first character in that subarray. Now what do I do? What, what can I do immediately? What's one thing that I can do immediately that's a little bit of an optimization, depending on what this value is? Yeah. 
So that's what I'm about to do. But there's one place where I know I can just stop and keep going. That's if this value is a or dot, right? Yeah. So if my first symbol is equal to a dot, I'm just going to continue. I'm going to go back to the top. I don't need to keep looking. Why? Because if there's a dot anywhere in the subarray, there's no winner. I need three in a row, and, and any, none of them could be dots. So if the first one is a dot, I'm done. Okay? So now let's see what happens. Okay, so now I'm, there's, there's one subarray I'm not even checking. It's the one at the end. Because the first character is a dot. So I say, no, I'm, I'm not done. Okay, now what do I do? So I know that there's a valid player that played in that first position. What do I do now? has an idea. There's a val I, I know who played in the first position in this subarray, and I know how to get to all of the other positions. So what do I do? Yeah. That's true. So I can't I can do that. So that's a clever idea. So the idea here is, look, tic-tac-toe only has three dimensions. This is actually not that tough to check for. Right? So if I say if first symbol is equal to the second one in that subarray, and if it's equal to the third one, then I'm going to return it. I'm done. I found a winner. In that case, I don't even need this loop at all. Right? So this is a way to solve this problem. I don't love it because it doesn't force us to loop through the uh, second level of indices, but it works. Let me get these onto the same line, actually. So if all three, so this is my check right here. If all three symbols are the same, then I have found the winner. I can return that immediately. Remember, the tic-tac-toe, by construction, should only ever have one winner. So as soon as I find a winner, I'm done. All right, so let's try this. Now I need to print the value of this, since I'm not printing inside of it anymore. Okay, so there's no winner yet, which is what we expect. Let's see if I'm checking, I'm, I'm checking in this dimension. Okay, so now, if there's a winner in that second dimension, I'm going to I'm going to return it. So this seems to be working. One of the things that we're going to start um just going to jump ahead here and we'll come back in a second. One of the things that we're going to start um uh, you know showing you guys how to do and particularly it's important when you're working on MP1 and other homework problems in the future is understanding how to test your code. And this is something you can do in our um slides, it's something you can do on the homework. Testing is something that you know we heavily integrate into the class but but as I've said before, this is like such a huge part of modern software development. Um, you know, it is essentially how using computers to help you make your code better. And computers are very good at many things, and that is one of them. All right, so here's one way to, to think about how to write test suites. So essentially, what you do typically, now the test suites that we give you for the MPs are different, but normally when you're testing code, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll come up with some inputs that you know the answer to. And you'll check to make sure that the code that you wrote returns the same thing you expect. There's an art to this. And the art involves picking test cases that are hard. Picking test cases where your code might fail. And so there's kind of a fun aspect of this where you get to be adversarial to your own code. You're trying to break it. So when you're writing your code, you should love it. You know, you should try to make it as good as possible. When you're testing it, you should be as skeptical about it as possible. You should try to find ways to break it. Try to find places where you think it won't work. Sometimes we call these corner cases, particularly if there's weird inputs. Like, what does it do if I give it invalid inputs or something that it wasn't expecting? All right, so 
Let's go back here and, and do a few more test cases. So, so right now, here's, here's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to clear the board except for this one dimension. I'm going to make sure that I get the answers that I expect. Okay, so if I've got three x's, I should get x. What should I get now? There's no winner. What about this? Are there three in a row? Nope, also dot. What about if I have something like this? What do I expect? Dot, good. What about here? Maybe my code can only detect if x is the winner. What should this return? Oh. What about, let's test one of the ones I was worried about. What about if it's all dots? What should this return? Dot. And also, let me, uh, the, the other thing I want to do here is I'm going to put, because um, maybe it's returning a dot incorrectly. Maybe it's returning a dot as part of that check, but no. It says didn't find winner. So it's dropping through and it's hitting the default dot. Alright, so we've done part of this. Let me give it a different input. So what who won this game? If I printed this off, you would see XXX in a row. They're all in the first uh, position in each subarray. So those actually line up when I look at the game. So X won this game. What is my code going to return? Yeah. My code does not find a winner for this game. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm only comparing within each subarray. I'm not looking for this pattern. Now, this is a valid way to win tic-tac-toe, so I've got to check for it. I'm going to leave that to you guys on a homework call. Um, but we're not quite done here. So, you know, this code is a good starting point for what you have to do next, um, but there's more to be done here. Uh, there's, there, I actually have to go through and loop through again and look through winners in the verticals, not just the horizontal. Okay, good. Questions about this before we go on? MP1, our homework problems for the next few days, you guys have got a lot of practice with multidimensional arrays. In case you haven't noticed it yet, so this is kind of the pattern that we, we repeat in this class. We throw something new up for you to look at in lecture. There's homework problems over the next couple days. This multidimensional arrays, recognizing them and understanding how to declare them will be on the quiz, but there are no quiz um, programming questions about multidimensional arrays. There will be next week as part of the midterm. But for now, it's just about, you know, the syntax, things like that. And then the MP, MP1, will force you to get very comfortable with it. Um, so this is sort of how we introduce ideas in this class. Okay. One thing I want to talk about quickly before we're done. I'll save this problem for next time. Um, and some of the other things for next time is string equality. Because there's a homework problem out about this today. So. Up until this point in this class, you guys have been testing whether things are equal using, how do you do that? The double equal sign. Single equals is assignment, double equals is equality. That's what we've taught you up to this point. Here's the problem. That only works for Java primitive types. It only works for ints, longs, floats, doubles, cares, booleans. From this point forward, we're going to be doing a lot more work with Java objects. And strings, as we talked about when we talked about strings, are Java objects. And so, this is not going to work. Now, it's confusing. Okay? I know this is confusing. And I'm, I'm, I'm pointing this out not because I want to frighten you or because I want to talk about what's actually going on behind the scenes here. I don't. Okay? But when you use this, so remember we talked about the fact that in Java, I can initialize a string with a literal. This is really the only object in Java where you can do this. It's part of a recognition of how important strings are. If you do, if you initialize your strings that way at the top, then the double equal operator will work 
And again, this is so confusing. Because if I initialize my strings this way, on lines 5 and 6, that other way that we uh, looked at initializing strings, it doesn't work. I will be happy to explain why this is the case in excruciating detail on the form. But for now, I just want to point out that this doesn't work. It doesn't work all the time. With strings, it works enough to confuse you, and I'm sorry about that. Um, if I had designed Java, maybe we would have done this a little bit differently. Um, but in general, when you compare two objects in Java, you cannot use the double equals operator. Instead, now how you determine object equality is actually pretty interesting, something that we'll come back to. But for strings, we're going to make use of the fact that a string has a method for comparing it to another string. That method is called dot equals. And so, this does the right thing. So the double equal sign with strings will produce incorrect results. If I instead use the equals operator on a string, I get the right answer. And I can compare a string to another string. I can compare it to a literal. This is going to be false. This is going to be true. This does the right thing. The only problem here, what's going to happen now? Yep, a little bit of a reminder, and you guys are getting practice with this today on the homework, null pointer exception. So the null object in Java has no properties or methods that I can use. That includes dot equals. Now, however, I can do this. This will work properly, I think. Yes. So as long as I have a valid string variable, I can use its methods. But if I have null, I can't use those methods. I can compare a string to the null string, which will return false. Um, but I can't compare it um, using its own methods. It doesn't happen. Yeah, question. So uh, it's a great question. So double equals does work for null. So this will print true. And this will print false. So you can use double equals, and you should use double equals to check for a null variable before you use it. But if you want to compare two valid strings, two strings that you know are not null, you should use dot equals. And again, we will test this on today's homework. Today's homework is one of my favorites in the class because it is so simple. And yet, you guys are not going to find it easy. Uh, we'll go over it on Wednesday in class. And you guys will hate me because it's so easy. It's going to bother you. OK. I have a couple of announcements while you guys are packing up. Um, one thing that's really important and I'm going to announce in class, I'll announce on the forum today, too. So if you're taking this week's quiz, hold on. This is, this is critical. I want to make sure everyone, I want to make sure that I can defend myself and say that I told you this. For the past two quizzes, you've lost points for check style if it failed. On this week's quiz, you will not be able to submit your code until you pass the check style test. That will be true for the rest of the semester. So we've eased you into this. This is the same way the homework problems work. Starting this week, no credit if you don't pass check style. Good luck finishing up MP0. My office hours will be in the basement today. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.